I, I see we have a few more people than usual tonight, and I assume that is because tonight we have uh, Max Kuhn and Julia Sogi here, the authors of Tidy Modeling with R, um, and Max is the like, originator of the whole Tidy Modeling ecosystem. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, that section, the basics, um, and anything else that might come up. I definitely see that we have some other questions that aren't necessarily covered in that section. Um, so thank you very much for being here, both of you. And we have some questions that we gathered um, that I'm going to I'm gonna start asking them. And then, like I said, I'll open it up and we'll just do a normal uh, meeting from there. So thank you. So the first question I have here is from John Leslie. Uh, he says that he mentors at a data science boot camp where most projects are based in Python and they use scikit-learn. And a problem that he sees is that such tools abstract a lot of the modeling know-how away. Um, and while that reduces the friction for modeling, it can also enable someone to create models without really knowing what they're doing, thereby, thereby making it easier for fundamental mistakes to creep in. Uh, tidy models seems to strike a good balance in that regard, and he wonders if that was a deliberate consideration when you were developing the framework. And that's probably more Max. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, Julie really could probably think of it, uh, examples too, but there have been a lot of times where we've said no to things. Um, like sometimes we say no to feature requests or even PRs because it might add more complexity than we really want or it might be worth for that feature. But there's other times where um, we just think that, yeah, like a pro user could do this and get away with it, but it would be really, it has potential to be misleading for somebody who doesn't really, um, isn't well versed in things. So there, there are some guardrails, I think. And, and the good news is like, I think, I don't think there's anything that somebody has said, oh, I really want to do this that they couldn't do anyway. They just wanted a nicer API for it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I have a lot of experience with like, like personal experience with, uh, especially in my last job where we had a lot of like uh, bench scientists doing really, like we gave them tools for um, a lot of like high dimensional data analysis and they would use other like off the shelf tools in, and they would like normalize a microarray like seven times because they weren't sure which of the seven options they should use, <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, you know, right. Right? And, and so, you know, we, we try to like, not enable that kind of thing like you know if you just don't know like oh do that and um yeah we're definitely designed that to be the case yeah whenever we talk about the goals of what we're doing like one of the things we have as like a top line goal is <clears throat> like um uh, uh, supporting good statistical practice you know um and that that happens both in how the like packages get written like, like how actually do people interact with the functions that we write and how arguments are chosen and named. And it also um, happens in how we talk about using our packages, um, how we talk about, um, uh, you know, how we demonstrate how to use them, um, documentation from like literally man page type documentation to um, like longer scale, like how we demonstrate how we're using it. So it's, it is for sure, like, like we, if we were to like list a couple of like, you know, you know, three top line goals or something like that is one of them, you know, like that, that people who use tidy models um, experience um, uh, uh, constraints, you know, of like, oh, this is going to he like head you in the right direction of doing things, um, uh, in a way that you're going to have like good results. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> All right. So next, uh, Pavitra has two questions merged together. Let's see how this goes. So um, it's getting very, a little bit maybe in the, in the weeds more than that one. And uh, we're going to go back and forth a little bit. On like so, yes. Um, so when you do a five-fold cross-validation, and say a data set of 100 elements, 80 for testing and 20 for the estimation of each fold, do you create five sets of 20 elements and then just randomize the way you create the resampling CV data sets? So that's a very specific question. That's, let's stop there. Did that make sense? Were you able to follow? That was very, very detailed. <laughs> 
I'm a little bit of a more visual person than yeah, like an auditory me, person. <laughs> I'm gonna so, also, so yeah, that's been very helpful actually. That's very helpful there you for go. me. Um, so I was gonna say that is a very specific, <clears throat> and so I understand that that's gonna take some reading. Yes. So if you've got a data set that has a hundred things in it, and you do fivefold cross validation. Do you create five yes. sets of 20 elements? Yeah. 20 elements? So I looked it up. Okay. Okay. So what it, what it does is it would, it would make a vector that is one through five and repeat that as many times as it needs to do to get like N elements. Okay. Right. So it's, it's like, uh, What's the function? Uh, rep length out equal n basically, and then we just we just scramble that, and that's how okay. samples get it. So I think that is kind of what that person is saying. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not quite. We don't make twenty elements. We basically right. make sequence like integers one through five as many times as we need to, and then just scramble. Okay, that makes Unstratified. sense. That's what we do. <laughs> All right, so now we have a question of um, like predictors being out of range, out of sample. So uh, she asks if I have a if I've created a step function on say a variable that's latitude and longitude of the location, and I'm using that in my regression model to be a predictor for my housing price. Um, basically, uh, the question is is around how like. How, how to normalize for that, how to decide that your sample is in sample when you're using something that's a little bit more complicated like latitude and longitude and finding, um, like making your model still be valid. Um, I don't know, I mean, again, it's a very specific case. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with like watching out for those kinds of things where it's out of sample, but it's hard to see that it's out of sample? Does that make sense? I think so. We so one thing that um, that this makes me think about is a set of tools that we have um, that, like, if you if what you're wanting to ask questions about is um, like a new data point is really different from the training set, um, and you like you want to make a prediction from it, but you're like, well, this is really different from the training data that we that we have, and so we want to be able to. Um, measure, like measure how much, um, like measure how different this new, like, hey, hey, I've trained a model on some training data and now I want to make predictions and things are going along, but oh, this new, this new data point came in and it is really different from my training data. And I want to be able to quantify how different it is. Um, we, we, ha we do have a package that fits into um, you know, the, re the rest of the whole ecosystem of what happens that lets you take, um, to make those kinds of measurements. It's called um, uh, Applicable. Applicable oh. is the name of it. I'll, I'll drop the link in here. And the, I I'm not sure if, if that's exactly what that question was about, but yeah. um, nice. it, rem it makes me think <laughs> about that. Like, is, is that, is that what we're talking about I here? It's it, like, it seemed maybe it was more about the, pre the outcome about, I'm not sure. I think it. I think that's exactly uh, what she was going for. So, yeah. and I was not aware of applicable. So that's going to be, um, yeah, it, interesting to look at for sure. Part of, part of it like, makes me think that maybe is the question like, like, did I develop something on in sample data, but how do I know it works well on out of sample data? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, or how do I know? Um, that it sounds like applicable is is part of what to look at of. Um, how how do I know how wrong how different my new data point is? How's, yeah, what's it that's good? definitely so, what it does. Yeah. Okay. And that name that name for that package comes from uh, computational chemistry. At least has this thing, this whole sort of subfield of what they call applicability domains. Okay. Because you can always get a prediction out of a model, and the question is, was the date was the is the model applicable for this new data point? Like, how much like the training set was it? Should you trust it? Kind of thing. Right. So. Excellent. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions here around like recipes and 
um, EDA and what you should do, like what should be in the recipe, what should be outside of the recipe? How do you decide where that line is? Um, Julie and I are both like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good question. Good question. Um, and so I'll, I guess specifically, what are some examples of when we should transform data before a recipe with mutate, for example, versus with a recipe with step mutate? So, I, so I'll say something and I'll be really interested in seeing, like hear Max's reaction to what I'm about to say. And like if you if Max has something different to say. <laughs> so I think if you're ever learning, if you ever want to learn something from training data and apply it to um, new data or testing data. So this is something like you want to learn a transformation or you want to. Um, so, you know, something like, like PCA, or you need to learn the mean, um, uh, you know, from your training data to be able to divide it. And then you want to like divide that same mean from like for your testing data or new data when you get it, or like TFIDF is a really good example of this in um, NLP, like in text, because you have to learn the vocabulary from the training data. And when like the new data comes in, um, you, you don't have, like you might get new words, um, like that IDF number, you compute all that on the training data. So that's an example of something you would do in a recipe. If there's something that you're not learning it from training data, it's just, it's just like, um, divide by two or like, like take the log or, you know, like you're not learning it, then, uh, then I say, do it outside a recipe, do it before. Um, so that's, that's a take, that's a take I have on, um, what to do within a recipe and what to do outside of a recipe. What do you think, Max? <laughs> or backwards. Yeah, so. Oh, no, no, no. It was a good okay, other no, way. Okay, okay. <laughs> Unless no, you were really just giving me a bad or no. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a really good answer. Um, that's pretty much what I would have said. Um, the, the only, like the one or two nuances I can think of is, you know, sometimes recipes are nice because you can do some deterministic calculation. You could have done on a mutate, but it's nice to have it in that recipe because it's like all in one place, right? Um, but, you know, if it's some sort of like really complicated um, uh or expensive computation, but you know, you're always gonna get the same result no matter what's in the data set, then yeah, you know, pull it out and do it ahead of time. So that, that doesn't need to get resampled. Um, now, the one thing that uh, I can't remember if it, yeah, it's probably come up in the book at that point is like we, so this, let me take a minute to explain this. So one of the things we, we do, I did in Carrot that paid off a lot and we do in Tiny Malls is we sort of like segregate or, let's say quarantine, like what data gets used where, right? And so, um, and because of that, it, the system is written so that when you make predictions on the data, you have no guarantee of having the outcome data available, right? So that makes sense for parsnip, right? Like you shouldn't need the outcome in your data set to make predictions on new samples. But one consequence of that is in the chapters you'll get to in a little bit, where we do model tuning, that same um, that same constraint is there. So when you're doing model tuning, like tenfold cross validation, things like that, you actually do have the outcome with you, but like our system is designed to, to you know, so we don't have any, you know, what we call information leakage or right. any fitting things that people might accidentally do. We don't have that data there. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is one thing that we try to convince people to do is if you're doing any transformations on your outcome, do them to the data before the recipe. Uh, okay. Because the thing is, let's say you log, this is the most, con like one of the most common questions we get. And it's not, it's not trivial. So it's not like people are just like not getting it. Um, so, you know, you, let's say you log transform the outcome in the recipe and then you go to do model tuning. Okay, well, you know, when, when the recipe gives the data to parse them to make predictions, it doesn't give it the outcome. So the outcome, you know, isn't, it isn't there. And, and also in the recipe, even the recipe is not given the outcome. So, you know, one thing you would have to do is in step log, do this like skip equal true argument. So it doesn't break because why won't actually be there when you're gonna make predictions. And even if it were there, um, you know, even if it were with um, the, the actual data outside of the recipe, it wouldn't get transformed so it wouldn't be in the right units. So um, it seems like something, and I, I think like in my original thinking about this, it didn't occur to me that that would happen. 
And so it wasn't really built, the system wasn't really built in a way that um, uh, was obvious that you shouldn't do that. But then once we started doing it, it's like, oh yeah, that's that's not right. So, you know, we, we've done as much as we can to like um, educate and document everything about this. But that's an example where in a way, you know, you kind of want to do that in the recipe, but but don't. Uh, you should do anything, anything in the outcome data you should do ahead of time. Okay, that makes sense. All right, next up, uh, Tony asked, are there cases where you would use dimensional, yeah, dimensionally reduced features, for example, from step PCA, alongside um, the, like, the original features? Uh, I've I almost always seen these features used entirely on their own. For, so only PCA components, uh, typically for unsupervised tasks. So would you ever have PCA components, but then also other things with it? <laughs> In other examples you can think of at least. Uh, I mean, I think the idea, the idea usually is that you t use the original, you know, variables and yep. you find the new, the new uh, representation to be able, and you could use again use that as like predictors in a model. But if you kept the original predictors and the PCA predictors, um, you know those will be those are like linear combinations of each other. Right. So those that um, wouldn't be a good idea for most models to have both of them. So I I so so typically I think you wouldn't. Um, have both you can usually like try tuning you know like try tuning like hey should i have should i just keep the linear predictors or should i you know should i go and try to make um uh you know these new dimensionality like these these reduced features like with pca components and say does it help me to try to find this new projection to use instead um I don't think you would typically use both because they, they're just like, yep. you know, like linear combinations of each other. Yeah. Did I, I just wanted to- What do you think, Tony, Max? Did I, did I represent your question properly? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I also <laughs> thought like there was never a case, but I just, I don't know. Like maybe there is a case and I'm just, I'm not sure. <laughs> Billy Julie is like, like laying like little landmines for me to step in and be like, ah, what do you think, Max? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I'm like, is, is there something else? I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking like, oh, when would I, have I ever done that, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to PCA everything, right? You know, so you could have like non-PCA predictors in there, but they wouldn't be the ones that went into PCA. And the only time I could think of like even supposing to do that was, is you can imagine like, you can imagine like putting something in like a tree and not knowing whether it should use like a linear combination. There are some tree baits that like oblique trees like make splits on linear combinations of the data. But um, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you put that on a tree, but I can't imagine that it would like crack the case. Like, oh, you know, we were 80% accuracy and now we're at like 90% accuracy because yeah, I, I just uh, yeah, <laughs> I can't I can't think of a situation where I've ever done that or would probably get a lot of bang on the buck. And, and to Julie's point, like there are a lot of models. If you do that, then it's just going to like uh, like zero out or put NAs in for like a lot of um, coefficients, and you'll get like a lot of warnings and stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, trying. There's a. A really long one that I'm going to skip for now because I haven't had a time to totally absorb what he's trying to ask. Um, but I will come back to yours, Jonathan. So Ozma asked, um, in what, in which circumstances, sh uh, if any, should we revert to carrot right now? Is there anything that you would that you still use carrot for over tidy models? Uh, I mean, carrot does have some stuff in it that tidy models does not. I mean, there's a lot more models that are wrapped there. So if your favorite model's not in there, then yeah, go crazy. Um, it does have all the feature selection stuff in it. Uh, now, I mean, rewriting that wouldn't, that would be pretty straightforward, but I don't think to do it anytime soon, to be honest with you. Um, 
so that that I think that would be the main thing is if I were doing some sort of if I think I needed like recursive feature elimination or um, like a genetic algorithm for feature selection, I think I might use carrot for that. I think there's anything else in there that's not really anywhere else. I think that's about it. Certainly, if you have a pipeline that's already written in carrot, yeah. Yeah. there's yeah. not a reason to like rewrite <laughs> it. Like, like carrot isn't going away, you know. So that's yeah. a good time to use carrot is when you have something that's already written in carrot. You know, like keep using that. But if you're, you know, starting something new, like like those things that Max has, has just said, be like, oh, do I think I'm going to use some feet like some modeling approach like that? Like maybe I'll think about carrot. Okay, and uh, Ozma has one more that I think we want to get in before Julia leaves. Uh, this one is about putting a model into production. Uh, even though I have never had to do this, but will soon, Ozma says. So what we what should we know and anticipate if we want to put a model built with tidy models into production? So I've been, as we've all kind of been thinking about this a little bit, but this is one of the things I've particularly been thinking about over the last couple months. And um, so, so one good option that you have right now is to publish this uh, as an API. So you can publish it as a plumber API and um, then like other systems in, you know, whatever kind of system that you have can then absorb it and um, like, like um, uh, get predictions from it as an API. Um, uh, somebody just put tidy predict here and we, we, you, you can, that means that's a way, that's a R package that we have that where you can put for certain kinds of models, you can put, write the output out as like SQL and then, um, it can like the, the model can live, um, as a SQL, uh, in, in a SQL database, um, like kind of like, um, you know, you write from dplyr, to like using db flyer to sql like you can write a whole a whole tree out you know like a whole set of trees out or um out into into sql um we're also um are working on options for um or, or if you have started learning a little bit about docker you can write you know like R and your model and the packages it needs into a Docker container, and then that can go somewhere. Um, and then, and then we're starting to talk um, to various like cloud providers about like like how do we get this working? If you already are a customer with some cloud provider, like can we like have a partnership to make this easier for um, uh, for these kinds of things to work better. So these are the kind of the kind of the, some of the options that are out there. And to be honest, they're the options that are out there for um, for Python folks too. You know, it's like um, an API, which Plumber is like, um, it is is excellent compared to the even the options that are out there for Python. Um, uh, you know, put it in a Docker container. Um, you know, these are a lot of the same options that are out there for anybody who's putting a model into production. So the, these are the things that are that are out there to start looking into. So talk to, you know, your data engineering folks and like, what do they want to do? Maybe start learning a little bit about APIs or start to learning a little bit about Docker and um, move forward. None of this is super, none of this is like stuff you can't learn and figure out and learn how to do. It's all, um, you know, it's it's all stuff that like you can figure out and learn how to do. I guess I would want to know if anybody here and maybe put it in the chat or whatever is using or using any tools like that. Yeah, I'm. I, that's great. I would also like yeah. to know that. Because, you know, we, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Julia did a lot of interviews with the people over like last year. Um, you know, it's something I used to do a lot of my last job, but with like a homegrown system. And it's like really, really want to do this, have like a really good set of tools for monitoring models and versioning models and deploying models. So there are tools out there to, to do that. Um, they are, to be honest with you, mostly written by Python people. And if there's a, if there's an R uh, adapter, um, it's usually, it's usually like if, if you describe a giraffe to somebody and ask them to draw a giraffe, you get like <laughs> the same results. Like the, you know, it's a thing but it doesn't really resemble the thing that you thought you described. So they're, they're not great APIs. Uh, and my dog's name is Argus. <laughs> or Doggo, as my kids call her. Yes. 
Yeah. And, and the person who's talking about, um, so Jordan here, who's saying that like, um, like doing feature engineering with SQL for new data, like that, that is a pain is that is correct. That is absolutely mm -hmm. correct. That is, that is tough. Like some of these other options can, um, I, I mean, I think there's reasons you don't hear about that a lot from Python people, that that's the direction they've gone. They've gone more towards APIs, Docker containers, you know, like that's what you hear more about. So. And, and yeah. just as an example, I, I have this like, it's an unrealistic dream to like have like a tiny predict interface for a lot of things, but you know, like including the recipe and things like that, but yeah. that's a pretty hard thing to do. Um, <laughs> And also like, there's like, how are you gonna do that for K&N? Or how are you gonna do that for like, you know, some, you know, bag tree imputation? Are you gonna like stick that expression inside of, you know? So, you know, it's, I really wanted to do something like that, but over time, you know, that sort of like all encompassing idea was kind of a disaster. <laughs> it would have been my GG biz. <laughs> <laughs> well. Oh, this man, is the it's, year. <laughs> it's a year. It's a year. It's a year. No, it's the year of Docker containers. It's the year yeah. of Docker containers. Um, I so I um ha made a time zone error, <laughs> and um I actually have to head out right now. So it no was problem. really fun. I am in this um Slack in the Slack group now, so I would love to um stay in touch and, and I love hearing about what everyone is doing. So um, Mac, Max will stay to answer more questions, but um, I have to head out now. So it was really great to get to chat with you all for a bit. Yeah, it's Thank great you. to see you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Um, you stuck with me. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I missed, I, I would have loved to ask this, but Tony threw in a question of, what's your favorite seed number? <laughs> well, have you seen the blog post about or the the tweet about this? I don't, not that I can remember. Let's see if I can find it, but somebody, um, somebody on Twitter did some analysis of GitHub repos and figured out that like what are the most commonly used seeds, and one of them was like I think it was like eight hundred something, and um, let me see <laughs> if I can find it, and and they were like, oh, it's this guy, this carrot repo. And um, uh, I think it's in Slack. Eight three four. We are we're seeing maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, let's see if I can find it. And and what it was? Okay, yeah, I did find it. Um, what it was is I have all these like I have a ton of like regression tests in Carrot. So if like every one of those models, like every combination of like resampling methods and recipe versus formula versus X, Y. I just like basically wanted to make sure the results really don't change over time. And so, you know, I have like this little function that generates like a random uniform integer between zero and a hundred. And I just did that. And then it just got copied and pasted like thousands of times <laughs> in that repo. And so in that one repo, there's this one number that gets used like an incredible amount of times. And that's, so 849 is the obvious answer to your question. That That is funny. But funny enough, like, okay, this is like theory versus practice, right? So I have this, like, if anybody's ever seen text expander, which is like a little thing, like snippets where you type in like a little code and it substitutes what you typed in for whatever you wanted it to. So like, if I mistype the as like HTE, it'll just replace it with the. And so I have a little thing on there that basically generates a random integer. And so for almost all my training materials and documentation, I always just generate a random integer. We had so many people who were just new to like programming be like, but why is it 1321? <laughs> yep. And I was like, well, it's just like a random number. And they're like, but, but okay. And so like Allison Hill and, um, and Mine and, and Julia, they were getting a lot of these questions when they were training and I never heard anybody ask that question before. So we started to get more, like I wrote another function that takes numbers between let's say zero and a hundred that are not surprising, like 11 and 22 and 33 and not these like somewhat <laughs> arcane funny. numbers that people might read into. That That's, that's really funny. Um, I love that people, like, of course, people read into it and try to figure out exactly what it means. Um, when it's, it, it didn't Crazy. mean anything. That's the numbers I typed. 
that was um, XKCD came about that he did a search for trying to find the letters that meant the least so that he could own them forever when he was first right. using it as an online name. Like no uh, acronym. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's, yeah, they can't stand for anything. They, they don't even overlap with other words. So, um, but again, then he gets questions of what does XKCD mean? And it's like, well, <laughs> nothing. It literally means nothing. So, all right. Um, let me see. So, um, uh, so the, the, the question that I was trying to wrap my head around is basically he's trying to wrap his head around uh, like prep and bake. And are there, is there anything outside of tidy models that you would kind of use as a, an analogy for prep and bake other than maybe prepping and baking food? <laughs> um, I just, I don't know, another attempt at saying it, cause I know a lot of people struggle with what's going like, on here. Yeah. So <laughs> should I explain those or like, is the question like, why, why those kind of thing? It's, it's trying to wrap his head around. Um, so is there, um, he says, I was hoping you might be able to relate prep and bake to R or programming concepts outside of the tidy models framework. Um, so, yeah. I mean, they're, they're analogous to fit and predict really. Um, so, you know, Prep does the calculations that you're going to need, right? So you fit a fit a linear model. It estimates your slopes in inter, in intercept, right? And that's basically what prep does. It's like, oh, you're going to center and scale. Let me calculate that stuff for you. Um, and 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 the reason that there's two verbs there is because a lot of the things we do in tiny models and ggplot and, and dplyr and a bunch of other stuff do this. They separate the estimation of something from the application of it. So whenever you do like LM, it you're saying like what you want to do, and then you actually do it. And for for various reasons, we we kind of delay execution on things inside the tidyverse. And so 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 prep really is analogous to like fit. And we thought about using verbs like that, but fit doesn't really really make sense when you're talking about like. I mean, it does. I mean, it is fitting an estimation, but right. like those words just didn't seem right for like pre-processing because people are like, oh, well, that's my model. I didn't say what my model is. And it's like, well, no, it's not the model. And then, and then bake, once we came up with prep, then bake just kind of like fell in place. And, um, and bake is most analogous to predict. So like in, in carrot, here's a, like a counter example in carrot, like I have a couple of pre-processing things that like make dummy variables and stuff like that. And to generate the dummy variables on a data set, I was using predict. And people are like, but you're not predicting. And I'm just like, well, I mean, I guess. So I felt like we couldn't use like standard verbs because we were using them in a slightly different context, which might be confusing. So we did it, right. we went in a different confusing direction with <laughs> uh, like a food analogy. So, I mean, you can think of like, like, again, like prep is like fitting where you're estimating stuff and bake is like, you're applying it. Like, uh, I wish apply were generic because like we would use that all over the place, right? Um, but like, you know, bake is really like applying or predicting is you're taking a, a calculation you've already done and you're projecting it or you're applying it to a data set. So those are the, I mean, and the good news is like, once you get to the next couple of chapters, you'll never really type bake or <laughs> prep or anything again, probably. Um, so. Yeah, we talked about that in the like intro to workflows chapter of, um, you know, and now we don't really have to think about prep and bake, but I, I really, yeah. I, I like the fit and predict analogy a lot. I don't think I had made that connection ever. And that totally makes sense. That is that. I like that. So thank you. And I hope, Jonathan, that that helped. Um, all right. So uh, Tony asked, can you talk about the design process of metric sets as functionals? For example, Ames metrics is gets metric set, RMSE, RSQ, MAE, then calling Ames metrics dot, dot, dot. The idea of using functionals is interesting, but what are the actual practical advantages? And I'm going to put that in the chat in case you need to like look at that again. Yeah, that's something that, so so here's here's how Max works, is I get on like public transportation, like a plane or like Metro North on New York, and I will write an R package. 
I'll get like 15% of an R package done. And yardstick is one of those. And <laughs> so I wrote like the initial bare bones of that and a few metrics just to like play around the API. And then we hired Davis. And I was like, Phew. right. <laughs> and so then Davis rewrote basically the whole thing, which great idea. And, um, and so he came up with the idea of metric sets. And, you know, and it is like an interesting question, like how do we design that? That is, so, you know, why do we do it that way? I think it's one of the more elegant solutions that we could come up with because you could imagine like an api where you said metric set and we give it like a character vector of functions right i mean that would be would not be a like on the face of it like a horrible idea right but then you think about like well you know what happens when you add more metrics do you have to update <laughs> some like database somewhere um what happens when you want to give it an alternate like like, you know, we're doing like the, like the F, um, F measure, like F1, F2. So where do you put F in? Like whether it's one or two, you know, if you want, if you want to have different arguments, like how do you do that? And so the whole functional programming aspect of that or the like metaprogramming aspect of that is, is something that just Davis did one day. And I think, honestly, I hate to call him out, but like, I think when we start really like incorporating that into everything, he was like, oh shit. Like, I don't really <laughs> like that interface. I think he, I think he was like, well, no, no, not that. Like that was just playing around. And then it was like a thing. I'm like, no, we're keeping it. And so I think in hindsight, I don't think he's like upset about that being a thing, but I think he had other ideas for ways to, to make that. And we just sort of like, yeah, we need that. And you implemented it. So we're, that's what we're using. Um, so, and, and it's, and it's interesting, like when I first looked at it, you know, I want to, I want to interrogate that object and get like the direction out of it. Like, you know, should I maximize RMC or minimize it? Like all that stuff's in there and it's in basically like an environment inside the object. So, you know, computing on it's a little bit differently, a little bit different. It's almost like an R6 or like a Python OP, sort of like you're embedding these methods or objects inside of the thing you're going to carry around. So it's a very, it's a different API. It wasn't like we had a big discussion about like, what's the best way to do this, which we do a lot of times. Um, and that's what we came out with is, I think Davis was like, yeah, that'll do it. And then that's what happened. <laughs> and I should also say, Davis, Davis works a lot on infrastructure things in Tidy Bottle. So he's about half and half between them. And he probably wrote uh, metric set when he was doing a lot of work on Arlang with Lionel. So I have, I'm not blaming <laughs> like Lionel or Arlang for that, but I would, I would really bet that that had a huge influence on how he approached that particular problem. Well, I, I think the, the question about it came about because, um, you know, we did the, uh, advanced R book club. And so thinking of things in functionals, um, and so, yes, it, I can totally understand it coming out of Arlang, um, yeah. Because we, yes, <laughs> we experienced that as well. All right. It's nice so, that somebody in our group understands our life. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We got to do it. Yeah, yeah. A, it is a complicated package for sure. Um, all right. So we have a question from um, Arjun about recipes. So this is another kind of like in the weeds question. But uh, prep has the strings as factors argument. Uh, that defaults to true, but you can set it to false when you prep yeah. or bake. Is there an equivalent? How would you do that inside of a workflow? Can you do that in a workflow? I think. Um... <laughs> and I tried to uh, do a quick search through yeah, help. That's what I'm, see. Do, I'm like, uh... huh, I don't know. Great question. Um, <laughs> and I want to say that we've talked about this either inside of an issue or something else. Um, let me look. So there, it might come through in the blueprint. So workflow has like the, when you add um, certain things, you can add it like a blueprint. Let me see a recipe. Um, <laughs> Let me look real quick. Hmm. It doesn't look like there's a way to, I don't think it looks like there's a way to do that. Um, yeah. I don't know. If there's not already an issue for that, I would file an issue with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, it's a, yeah. no, it's a really good question. And, 
and I should also say that um, like we want to we want to like a lot of people just want to use parsnip for recipes, and that's cool. We're totally cool with that. Um, you might be like, well, you know, it looks like the rest of the tiny verse is going to string strings as factors, and R is going to, like base R, like strings as factors equals false. Like, what, what, why would you go the other direction? And the main reason is like outside of like text mining, we kind of want to know what the levels are. Um, so you know, when you make dummy variables, you definitely want to have that as a factor, right? Um, like I've I've probably answered like maybe a hundred stack overflow questions like this over the years about like, well, oh, why do I get discordant results when I have new data that says like, I don't know about this level or the levels are different and things like that. So in general, when you get the modeling, factors really should be, with a, with a few exceptions, factors really should be how sh you should encode your non-numeric data. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, all right. Um, a couple of really specific questions, and then we're going to um, open it up to the, well, I think we've a bunch in the chat, and we'll see what happens. All right, so um, the first one is, uh, do you have any plans to extend tidy models for spatial and spatial temporal models? So or Julia just last week released a spatial resampling yeah. package. Um, there are more methods. It only has like one like clustering based method uh, in there. We want to add more to that. Um, and just as an aside, I think I shouldn't say this in public when it's recorded, but like one strategy I think a lot of package authors have with CRAN is to send in the minimal viable package because it gets through CRAN easier. Um, another reason we didn't implement everything up front was like there's a bunch of things we can do using like SF and some other packages that have more significant dependencies. So, um, so that's why we've sort of have like a side package, like a R sample adjacent sort of package for spatial sampling. Um, so, you know, here's how like models get in and out of, into like, it's true carrot too. Like back when I was adding a lot of models, like how things get into tiny models like a parsnip are based on like what we're working on. Right. So, <laughs> so like in it, and so like, you know, we, we are doing a lot right now with survival analysis. Thanks very much to Emil, um, who started that, that, uh, package. And, and so a lot of times, like we'll make a push into certain areas because we know they're underserved. And, and a lot of times, like we, we, I don't think any of the four of us, I don't think we have any experts on spatial analysis. So sometimes what we need is somebody to be like, hey, here are like the four things that would be great. And here's what you need to know about them. That, that helps a great deal for us to, to do these things. So we'd be happy to do more of that. Absolutely. Um, it's not something that I know a lot about. It's, it's why I've never really also done much with like time series, just because it's never been my bag. And, and a lot of other people do it. So I like why recreate the wheel. But if, if somebody's really interested in that, then I would say like put in put in a couple issues like in Parsnip or put in like one issue um, there or, or wherever you think it should be. Uh, like if it's more recipe stuff, put in recipes. We, we very happy to do stuff like that. It's just that it's not high on our list because none of us are really um, pressed to do it. And we don't, we'd have to do like a lot of reading and, and stuff <laughs> to get started. So, yeah. Well, uh, very fittingly, the next question is from uh, August, who asks, uh, he has a few things in here, but the, the first main thing is, uh, what package system do you think works best for time series in a tidy models workflow? Uh, model time, fable, something else? I don't know that I'm qualified to answer yeah. that. Um, <laughs> That's, a, I think, a valid answer, but... I mean, model time works a lot more with our stuff. Like the the like um, uh, Rob Hyman's um, uh, fable and all that is like I feel like it's kind of like the gold standard, um, but it's not really like a tidy models thing. Like there's some de definite differences between like you couldn't even like I think use that stuff with tidy models just because of how it was designed. Um, and I was like, and they're you know they're pretty smart people. They know what they're doing. Um, but it, but I kind of wish in hindsight, like they, we talked to them a lot more just to get consistency between what we're doing and what they're doing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified to answer that. 
to be honest with you. I was going to say, I think that answer um, answers the rest of his question in that uh, he has a lot of questions here. I'm going to just go ahead and share in the chat if you want you know, to go into everything about uh, time series. This, but, I, this might be like stepping in it, but you might want to like put that in our studio community because like Rob's on there. Like, I mean, okay. that, that website is basically like his issue tracker and discussion okay. form for his packages. So like that would be good. Um, he might he might answer that. And then okay. other people who are not me who know what they're talking about could also chime in. That's what I'd okay. yeah. All right, that is all the pre-questions. Um, I saw something that I wanted to ask. Would also, um, um, just so oh. you know, it would be Go great ahead. to um, have a, a list of the questions because like we do like when like that's one of the reasons I've been like reading right. the chats and stuff like yeah. that. So we want to we don't and I don't want to get into that. So now I, I shouldn't have biased you because like shit, he's reading our chats. <laughs> um, but at the same no, time, we, we definitely want to mind that like we do a stack overload questions to figure out like, all right, what is it about this that's bothering people? Um, For sure. Group, Really an example, which I think somebody picked up on, is recipes has some new selectors that are like all numeric predictors. Yep. Right? And that's because we started, we had so many questions across many different interfaces of people accidentally selecting the outcomes to make dummy variables. And then, you know, Mina, I think, was the one that suggested like, yeah, we should do something about that. So, like, it would be good to have, it would be good to have data where we could look at, like, okay, what are the questions people are asking? Because my memory is... <laughs> well we are happy to oblige um we i'm sorry because i know that our chats can be kind of crazy during these uh calls oh, so no in fact i'll let me just tell like a real quick story um when i first joined our studio before that i, I had a shiny license and my company insisted they had all the the authentication everything worked out fine it was a problem with shiny and so i was pestering sean loop about this once we bought a license and it ended up being, they didn't know what they were talking about. And my <laughs> people just messed it up. And I thought, Oh my God, they must think I'm an idiot. I'm going to work there. And so one of the first things I did when I got there was I searched through like the, the system we had uh, when we <laughs> like, we just type in like, Oh, here's what I did today to, to look for like my name somewhere. Like, Oh, this idiot oh. Pfizer doesn't know how to like set up. A th and there wasn't anything in there, but um, don't worry. I've, I've been there on the other side of it. <laughs> All right. Um, so there is, a, I think, a really interesting question here from Connor. He asked, what is the simplest feature engineering step uh, that's given you the most performance gain? So is there one thing that is like your your go-to? Probably not, but probably you not. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. like, you know, the, the thing that I do, especially like for interactions, is just start plotting the data and be like, what is going on with um you know x y and z like you know we you know the, the only way to be comfortable with your data is to like never look at it and and, and just in looking at it you're going to see stuff and be like oh wait like that doesn't seem right and then and then that'll that'll help you define features or figure out things that are not being um, and, I, and i'd say interactions are probably it's like i had to pick up one thing it's pretty boring old school stuff but like I don't think we think about interactions enough. Uh, I think that is great advice. Um, splines too. <laughs> I'd say splines. Splines. All right. Uh, sorry, I was trying to figure out some muting during that, but um, I think we got that taken care of. All right. Um, uh, that is all of the chat, and I think that's basically time. I guess, uh, you know, it, just what else? What would you like us to know? What would you like to know from us as we um, read the early version of the book? Just anything that just is like, that doesn't smell right, but you're like, oh, like, um, well, I'll answer that question. It's the second one, uh, Joe. But, like, you know, just anything that's like, like, you know, the question about, like, prep and bake. Like, those are the things that we really want to know. We want to know, like, like, there's some stuff, especially on the modeling side, that you might be like, why do you do that? And we try to document that as much as possible. Um, so, you know, just, I, I don't, I want everybody to be comfortable by saying, like, oh, I can ask them a question 
that they're going to think it's really obvious that, you know, I feel like kind of silly just asking it and don't like, like we, we, um, uh, we want to know those questions because that, because the, the biggest thing that one of the biggest things we focus on is like, believe it or not, like try to write as much and as good documentation as we can. Yeah. And those are the questions that really drive us because we're, we're really not developing for a person like me. We're developing for people that are coming out of like Excel or, or right. SAS or, you know, whatever thing BI is inflicted on them at their company. And so, so we wouldn't, we, it's easy for us to like, just miss that stuff. So like just anything that's like, this is kind of confusing and maybe it's obvious. Don't feel afraid to like ask us. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, geez, anything I want you to know? So, you know, we are updating the book. So there's nothing in there that's like, oh shit, we did that wrong. Let's update <laughs> it. But they're like workflows. We have a, another package that's almost ready to crank called workflow sets that we'll add yes. some stuff in where you can like m m biologist in me calls it like multiplexing where like you can give it a bunch of formulas or and or recipes and or other stuff and a bunch of models and it'll just, just you know go out and do them all awesome um, and so like Very we'll awesome. probably update the the chapters i'm hoping it'll be on cran like in a month um with that with that stuff so you will see some things that will go back uh to revamp certain parts and then Julie and I just spent like a, a little bit of time um, talking about what, like the the part three of the book is probably just going to be various topics that we feel like is helpful and interesting. So we're sort of like getting our ducks in a row to write those <laughs> chapters. So they'll sort of trickle in, maybe not in the order that they'll be in the book. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, we are definitely looking forward to see what happens because I, you know, I, I talked to you about that. I think we might end up diverting oh, the book future. club for a little while because we're yeah. about to get it. Well, we're not that far from getting ahead of you. Um, um, let me, Joe had the question. He, uh, are models the only models with feature section tiny models today? Do you have any concerns about using feature section in Mars when resampling? So first question is no, so car trees, even like boosting and, and even Rainforest doesn't really do this as much as people think it, it, it does. But there's a lot of models that um, like Mars will select features as it does the estimation. Like GlidNet's a great example. Like you do like a lasso model and in the process of esti estimating the parameters, you get rid of a lot of predictors. So there, there's, I'd probably say there's like five or 10 in there. Um, do I have any concerns with using feature section Mars resampling? No. And this is like a really common question that we get all the time. It's like, well, wait, you resampled that model. Every time you resampled it, you might've gotten a different predictor set. And the answer is like, yeah, that's a feature and not a bug. Because one of the things about uh, re, or feature selection is like it's, it's discrete nature, like it's in or it's out, um, raises sort of the variability of models sometimes. And so we definitely want to capture that variability inside of resampling, because if we don't, then we don't um, get really good performance estimates. So um, so no, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do it, to have that all happen inside of resampling. And then you estimate performance of how that algorithm works. And then when you go to fit it on the, the whole training set, like if you want to do that Mars model and take it to the test set, you do that on your entire training set and then the features that it selects are the features. You don't have to worry about like, what about the tenfolds and, and all the things that happen there. You just do that to measure variability. So um, so it's not really, it's, I, I think it's a good thing. Um, uh, mean target encoding and recipes, yes. Uh, you can do that with the embed package. It has like three or, or two or three functions to do that. Um, and so, um, I don't know how I feel about it, but it's there. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, there was a question about workflow sets, which you said is coming soon. It's getting close. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I, there's one part that's missing and then I'll, uh, or it's not missing. I just need to make sure it works. Like now with vectors, we, we have to write all these rules with tibbles. Like what happens if I remove a, what happens when I remove a row? Should it stay like a workflow set or should it become like a tibble? 
Like if you think about like tenfold cross validation, if you take like that R sample object and just delete a row, it drops it down to a tibble because it's not tenfold anymore because you only have nine folds there. All right. And so we have to write the rules that happen behind the scenes for like, is it cool to add rows? Is it cool to add columns? Um, and so that's not terribly hard to do, uh, but that's like the one thing that I'm sort of like want to get done before I send it to Cram. So, so yeah, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping to do that. So process things in parallel, and I put an issue in for that. I'm really torn about it. Uh, so, you know, let's say, let's say you come up with a combination of like 50 models in preprocessors and you want to run all those. Uh, you know, my head says, yeah, run all that in parallel, right? Um, so I might end up having an option to do that, but again, we were we're relying on resampling a lot, and so um, hmm. it's right now it doesn't do that. It does each individual workflow in parallel. Um, so uh, yeah, I probably should do that just to <laughs> for consistency. Like if you had like a if you had like a validation set, then you couldn't really run anything in parallel, or or you could run the model tuning in parallel, but you wouldn't do re. Resampling bits wouldn't happen. But anyway, yeah, I have an option there, but I need to think it through a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, maybe. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, but this was great. Um, and we are very much enjoying the book. We've got two clubs running now, and I think we're probably going to start a third one pretty soon. So, yeah, people are liking the book quite a lot. Won't spoil the remaining chapters for you. <laughs> Well, we will. It was Agatha uh, all along. <laughs> <laughs> Strong work. All right. Thank you very much. All right. See you later. See everybody. Bye.